right, Galatians 4, and we're in verse 7. Galatians 4, verse 7. He says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. That's good news right there. Now, I know that we serve Christ. That's our job. But we have a higher title than that. You're a son. He's made you a son. And so that's your ultimate title. However, as a son, you'll find out, we saw last week that yeah, sometime, that even a son is supposed to consider himself no more than a servant uh, as far as inheritance is concerned. So it, we've not inherited uh, everything we've got coming to us. So even as a son, a good son serves the family. His job is to be a uh, helper in the family, do what he's supposed to do. Jesus is called the apostle, um, the high priest, the apostle. Uh, and so we're a, a co-equal co with him. Not that you're um, the same as Christ, but in position, as far as the world is concerned, we're the representative of Christ to the world. That's what they're going to see when they're not going to find it outside of being a Christian themselves. John chapter 15. John 15, verse 15. Jesus talking to his disciples here. He says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. That's a mark of a friend. A friend talks to you. <laughs> communication. As far as Christians are concerned, we should be having communication with God all the time. And he says he wants to talk to you and tell you things. As you get in the Bible, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you. That's him talking. That's communication. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2 verse 11. Hebrews 2, verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Whew. Ah, he's got to do some fancy footwork in order to not be ashamed to call some of the brethren that I know brethren. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he says... He says right there, he's not ashamed of it. Now, obviously, he's looking at uh, your eternal perfection. When One day, when we get to heaven, there won't be, after the judgment, he's wiped it all out and made us totally perfect. There will be no shame associated to a Christian. There will be no remembrance of former things. You have never sinned. I mean, at that point, so God's got to be thinking about that side of things when he says, I'm not ashamed of these people that I've sanctified. <laughs> now, your salvation sanctifies you in a sense, but we sure mess it up day to day. Galatians 4, Galatians 4 verse 8. Galatians 4, 8. Howbeit then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Now, that's true. A man does serve uh, something. Man's made to serve. He's made to be a servant. I know that men don't think that. <laughs> but they are. You're made to serve. What uh, I know that um, it just doesn't click, but it really is service. For instance... Somebody who loves golf, which I don't like golf, but somebody who loves golf becomes a servant to golf. That little ball becomes their master. And you know how they, they, they worship? Is they go out there and they participate and they do all the things that golfers do. They study up on it all the time. Okay, well that's doing service to their hobby, whatever their hobby is. Man's going to serve something. God says, I've got something you can serve that's worthwhile. It doesn't worth, it does not, there's no worth in it. At the end of a man's life, if he's accomplished everything as a golfer, what good did that do him? Because you're about to go into something that has nothing to do with this life. 
I don't think God's got any golf tees up there in heaven. <laughs> Something way better. Galatians 4, look at verse 9. He says, For now, after that you have known God, or, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? He's saying, whatever your bondage was. Now, there's many different bondages out there. The devil is a master of um, providing different bondages. And they're not all seemingly wicked. You know, the bar attracts a certain crowd, but not everybody's going to be attracted to a bar. Some people will just be attracted to riches. Some people will just be attracted to self-righteousness. You know, appearing to be righteous, holier than thou. Okay, well, if it's not of God, if it's not through Christ Jesus, it's wicked. Uh, look at Psalm 96. Psalm 96, verse 5. He says, for all the gods of the nations are idol, idols. Now, I like, I like the word. The Bible uses words that make sense. The Bible's not written for some highbrow theologian. It's written for the common man. You know what idol is? Now, they've, I think they did this on purpose. They've done this thing so that you don't understand. Every car now is an automatic <laughs> not all of them, but by and large, it's all everybody drives an automatic because nobody knows how to drive a stick shift anymore. That requires, yeah, no, there's very few. The young kids don't. That's because you would understand what idle is. You put that thing in neutral, you're just idling, and if you don't get it right, the car starts moving. I remember when I was learning to drive a stick, I was up on a hill. My, my mom was teaching me. And, of course, it happened to be at rush hour. Cars lined up behind me. I couldn't get it in gear, slip it back into neutral where I'm safe, and then I'm rolling back. <laughs> talk, about, talk about sweating. That'll make you sweat. <laughs> That's idle. You know, idols are just that. They put you in neutral, spiritually. And, usually, what you find with idol is you always end up on some kind of hill. You're rolling in a direction you didn't intend to go in. That's what an idol does. It pushes you somewhere. It's not just you're not going anywhere. It's that you're being moved by a force beyond your control. Psalm 106, verse 36. Psalm 106, verse 36. And they serve their idols which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Now that's, that shows the um, demonic power behind serving anything other than God. There's the, on, the only place that's safe is God. And for right now, the only place that is safe is this book right here. And you before God trying to obey this book, that's safe. But anything outside of that is a trap waiting to snap. It's a snare is what he called it. Uh, that's what those idols were. Look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. An idol, something to serve and worship, is not really God. It can't be a God uh, as far as uh, a holy God, a, a true God. But the devil will tap into whatever you're dedicating yourself to if it's not holy and he'll take control of it. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 4 As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols we know that an idol is nothing in the world and there is none other God but one. Okay, the idol in and of itself has no power. But that doesn't mean there's no power behind it. If you think, if you think, if you're so brain dead that you think a little stick, a totem pole, is going to answer prayers to you, 
the devil will tap in. He says, that's exactly what I'm looking for. A blinded mind that cannot think. I'll put that in bondage to myself. And so he'll capitalize on it. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. He just told us the idol wasn't anything. But yet here he says they're sacrificing to devils. They don't even realize it. Now it won't be long till it becomes apparent that that's what they're doing. And at that point they'll be so brainwashed by the devil, they'll go right along with it. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Now, you would think Paul didn't need to write that, but he does, because there's many who have fellowship with devils. Think about it. How many shows have the wickedness built in them? The, the sorcery, the tarot cards, whatever, the, I'm not saying that right, but you know what I mean. <laughs> the witchcraft cards. <laughs> there is, uh, there's, there's an allure to the unknown out there and the devil capitalizes on it a man really desires to know about God but if he's not going to seek God's word to know about God the devil will provide him a counterfeit and that's where the witches and the hairy pothead comes in <laughs> all the rest of that imitation stuff look at Ephesians Ephesians 4 Ephesians 4 verse 4 there is one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling now that's the good side as a Christian you're put into the body of Christ every Christian is put into the body of Christ and notice what's attached to it the last thing on that hope of your calling a Christian has hope the lost world has no hope it's just a matter of time, regardless of how wealthy or how many toys they have, they don't have hope. They have momentary happiness, but that's only for a happening stance. Soon the stance is over and no hope sets in. A Christian should never have no hope because we've been given hope. Uh, verse five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in, bunch of Southerners, you all. <laughs> so only the Southerners get, no. <laughs> People make up their own little idols, but the only true God is the one we serve, the God of the Bible. The one that made the heaven and the earth. No other idol can boast that. <laughs> now they make, um, they make man think that he's in charge as though he's God. That's the, the humanistic standpoint is this. There is no God. You're God. You get to control your destiny. You control it all. We don't control nothing. <laughs> Sorry. As a, as a human, and especially as a Christian, you recognize you don't control even your day you can't control. That's right. God's got that thing. And you got to turn it over to him all the time because we start thinking we got control. <laughs> Galatians 4, Galatians 4, verse 9. He says, But now, after uh, that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Now, this is, he's talking to these Galatians who have been. Uh, subverted into thinking they need to go back under the law and they need to be law abiding uh, in order to persevere in order to maintain salvation and so he's kind of making fun of them here he's mocking them um, he's trying to say hey look you can't be made perfect by works otherwise works would have been needed to give you salvation Salvation did it all. It made you perfect. Remember we talked about being accepted in the beloved? Well, the only way you can be accepted is if you're perfect. God doesn't accept imp 
pure things. He told them that if they're going to bring a sacrifice, it's got to be perfect. Okay, he's not a God of, of um, convenience. Whatever works for you, okay, I'll bend my... No, he's God. Okay, the devil doesn't just accept anything you want to throw at him either. Okay, man has to serve. Galatians 3, look at verse 2. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. See how simple that is. <laughs> works versus open your ears. <laughs> okay, I can get the last part of that. I can open my ears. <laughs> works, I might fa I'm going to fail with that. Works, that's a system that is destined to failure. He's talked about it before. The reason for the law was to show a man he had a need. He would not be able to complete the law and to fall on the mercy of God. Galatians 3, look down at verse 5. He therefore that minister you the Spirit, uh, uh, to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Now that's back in the early days of the church when they were doing miracles. Uh, they were showing to the uh, Jews that God had now set up a new system, and this is what's the doctrine that applies to it. And so he's saying, was that based on works or on hearing your ears open? You know, a person cannot get saved outside of the Bible. You don't have to have hearing as far as humans are concerned to understand the Bible, but you have to have a hearing heart. The heart has to be open and accepting of what God has to say. The reason that's important is, we'll get to it in a minute, but the reason that's important is God usually says exactly what we don't want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you could keep your heart closed. But you have to come to the Bible with an open heart. Do some surgery. <laughs> and that's what he'll do. The, uh, here's a, a child's prayer. Oh, you like those children when they get to pray and because they're honest. <laughs> this child says this, Dear God, is Pastor Dan a friend of yours or do you know him through the business? <laughs> now, if you're saved, you are a friend of God. That does not mean you always act friendly to him. But he's there and he's declared he's not in this uh, I'm going to beat you up mode. You do that to yourself. We don't have to worry about God slamming us most of the time. Most of the time, we have to worry about the repercussions of what we've done. When you jump off of the roof, you don't have to worry about, God, are you going to punish me now and make me hit the ground? Mm -hmm. No, you already did that yourself. Okay, that's already complete. <laughs> you decided that when you leapt. <laughs> Galatians 4, verse 10. You observe days and months and times and years. <laughs> okay, this is how they've been putting themselves back under the law. You know, the law was all about, uh, we've got all these feast days that you have to do, and you have to do them for so many days, and here's what's done on that day. Uh, days, months, and times, and years, and certain years they did this, and certain years they did that. They're putting themselves back under bondage for it. Uh, Col uh, Colossians, Colossians 2, look at verse 16. Colossians 2, verse 16. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holiday, uh, holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Okay, that's the Old Testament system, the Sabbath days. Don't show a Seventh-day Adventist that. It just blows their mind, because they think they're keeping the Sabbath. He says, you can't judge me about the Sabbath. <laughs> now, really, when you get right down to it, there is no special thing about the day, sun day in and of itself. Wednesday. Those are just days we've set aside to meet. In communist countries, where they're hiding and meeting where they can, 
they're switching it up. They don't want to get caught. They've got to make sure that they're doing everything under the radar. And I'll bet you they ain't going to church on Sunday. <laughs> they're getting together whenever they can. And it's hidden and off the books. And Okay, so God's more important than one special day. He's every day. Amen. Colossians 2, look at verse 17. Colossians 2, 17. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Okay, so those Sabbaths, the, the holy days, the, the, all those things that God set up in the Old Testament are a shadow. They're a picture of something that will come, millennium and eternity. He says, but the body, if you're in Christ, you're the body of Christ, is of Christ. Do you think the body ceases to exist, you know, uh, five days out of the week? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's there 24-7 every day. So when you can get together, that's a good enough day. Don't worry about somebody saying, no, it's only on this day. Seventh-day Adventist will tell you it's on Saturday. It's not on Saturday. The Old Testament system, if they're trying to go by that, they got that wrong too. Because there, it's actually Friday evening at 6 o'clock. And it's not even our Friday. It's Jerusalem's Friday. <laughs> okay, so the time zone, you got to figure that out too. <laughs> so they're, they're getting that all wrong. Uh, Galatians 4, look at verse 11. Galatians 4, verse 11. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Ugh. Now, you know that Paul's not really afraid of them, but he's stressing a point here. He's saying, I'm just wondering if you're going to fall for this baloney. Did I come in there and teach you and pour out all of this uh, wisdom and understanding and work with you so hard, and then I turn around and you've been uh, bewitched? by these other people. He's like, I'm afraid I did all that labor in vain. Look at 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3. 1 Thessalonians 3, look at verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. <laughs> he said, look, I waited as long as I could. I had as much grace and mercy with you as I could. But there came a point where I was not getting the right reports about you. So, he says, For I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Hmm. You see that it seems like if you get somebody saved or you've got a, a new convert and you're teaching them, it's almost, uh, it's like a shiny lure that the devil cannot resist. And they'll be exposed to some cult. And that cult will seem like they got something on the ball. I've seen this so many times. People leave a church who has become a dead church. Because there's, there's, if you're not going to use Bible, it's just going to be dead. Amen. The less Bible you use, the more dead it is. Because the Bible's what's got power. So when a church begins to get away from Bible, not all the way, but, uh, you know, we overload the Bible here, which I think is safe. <laughs> but but when, a, when a church starts slacking off on Bible and starts raising the attract the world and bring people in... Yeah, the entertainment industry. What ends up happening is the people start thinking one of two things. They think, I'll take your entertainment when it's good. When it's not, I'll go find another one. Or the ones who are hungry spiritually start, you've already exposed them to entertainment. So they think, I like entertainment. You've showed me it's fun. But I'm not getting Bible. I like that too. So you know what they do? They run to charismatic. Because it looks like they're using Bible. And they are sure entertaining. And that's being bewitched by some cult. And it seems like that's the way it goes. He says here, 
our labor was in vain. Paul, I can just I can just see Paul. You know, he spent all of this time and effort traveling all over the world by foot and boat and being beat and stoned and all these things just so that he can witness to some people and help disciple them. He leaves town and the, the temple worshipers come in and take his whole crowd from him. And he's like, well, I did all that work and are you not thinking? <laughs> Galatians 4, look at verse 12. Galatians 4.12 <clears throat> Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. <laughs> Paul's not hurt by their conduct, observing these holy days and trying to put themselves back under the law. It does not lessen his rewards in the final judgment. When we get to heaven, it's based on not man's calculations of what you accomplished. It's based on your obedience to God's mission. He says, it didn't lessen anything on my part. I've done what I was required to do. And it did, everybody could have deserted me. I mean, think about it. They did Jesus. <laughs> okay, that didn't lessen anything for him. Uh-uh. He says, uh, that he, he says, they've not injured, you've not injured me at all all. <laughs> now, I think that this is not just him giving them information, but him encouraging himself. You know, David talks about that. And you, as a Christian, you're going to have to learn to do that. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Because you'll start witnessing and preaching to somebody, and the bugs will start flying. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then it won't be long. <laughs> That one of those beetles that keeps dying in here. <laughs> Say no to nature. <laughs> but anyway, you'll be working with somebody and it'll be discouraging if you start seeing them slip away and uh, take what you've said and you know not pay it any mind. And the natural reaction to that is, what's the use? You know? And so it, it has a double-edged sword. When they fall away, it tempts you to do the same. Paul's saying here, almost like he's saying it to himself. You've not injured me at all. This really did not affect me. <laughs> now convince yourself of that. <laughs> when your disciple decides to do a 180 and head the wrong way, think about it when you've done what you can do. Dr. Ruckman used to say this. Do all you can do, and then go fishing. <laughs> nice. After you've done all you can do, realize there's somebody bigger in control than you. And if you've done what you're supposed to do, you've accomplished what God intended, whether it looks like you got any results or not. Uh, Galatians 4, look at verse 13. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you, at the first. He's saying he was a sickly, or, or I think that he had eye problems. And he's saying through infirmity, I came in and did this teaching and preaching to you. Now infirmity usually means sick, sickly. They have an infirmary. That's what they used to call the hospital. The infirmary, it's for infirm people. They, their health is, they're probably their, uh, their immune system is not good. And I wouldn't doubt it a bit. You know, you start traveling out of state, you start picking up all the bugs that are out there that you're not used to. Pollen, yeah, the, the different pollens, yeah. And you get sick. Well, Paul's traveling country to country, all these different places. No doubt, no doubt he's being exposed to germs that are making him sick. And he's just keeping on mission and keeping on going. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 16, he says this, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. <laughs> Did it die yet? No, he's trying hard enough. Okay, good. <laughs> I hope it does. I do not like it dying 
It's a good snack. <laughs> so he's sick. He's still doing his job. He says, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy. You know, when you'll go ahead and do what you're supposed to do, especially when you don't feel like doing it, God gives you an extra dose of mercy. He does something special for you. There are things we're supposed to do. There are, th I'm just going to tell you, there are times I don't want to come to church. Now, there's not too many. I, I love going to church. I love, do I love what I do. But there's some times that it would be easier to stay and do something else. And you just do it anyway. And when, when I'll do it against my will, I get a special dispensation, like Paul says, of grace. God dumps out a little extra blessing because you've done something for him to the detriment of what the will wanted to do. And that's good. All right, we better stop it there. I, I didn't realize how late it's gotten. We'll pick up at Galatians 4.14 next time.